Hello. Uh, today, we're going to talk about beetles. Beetles are the subject of this year's um, Wild About Gardens campaign, which is jointly between the Royal Horticultural Society and Wildlife Trust. And beetles are a remarkably neglected group, if you like. It's a huge group. They're, they're insects and they're the order Coleoptera and there are an awful lot of them. 370,000 named species in the world. And remember that quite a lot of them probably have never been named, probably never been seen. So the world is full of beetles. And there are over 4,000 species of them in the United Kingdom, which is quite remarkable really, because when you talk to people that aren't insect specialists, they could probably name about half a dozen, um, usually starting with a ladybird going, well, is it a beetle? Uh, there's quite a lot of things that aren't really beetles that look a little bit like them, but there's plenty of true beetles to get our heads round. The distribution is a bit shady. Um, I think perhaps that um, the distribution of beetles recorded probably reflects the distribution of people who can recognize beetles rather than the actual distribution of beetles. So lots and lots of things to find out about beetles. Huge range of shapes and sizes and morphologies of these creatures. And some of them are really quite beautiful when you look at them very carefully. They have a fairly standard insect lifestyle. The adult, the female lays eggs which hatch into larvae. They go through two or three instars, which means they shed their skins and grow bigger and grow bigger. And then when they've got big enough, they pupate and hatch out from the pupa as an adult beetle. And quite a lot of them, the adult stage is quite short compared to the, the, the larval stages. They can, and some of the larger ones can go three or five years as, as larvae and a, a very short time as an adult. It's fairly typical of, of, of the insect. And they've been around a hell of a long time. Um, the first proto beetles, if you like, um, are around 270 million years old. And proper beetles, true beetles, as we recognize them now, for about 230 million years. They were the first flying creatures. They, the, the insects really have the skies to themselves. This is long before the dinosaurs, long before birds. And basically, insects have it made. They're also the first pollinators. Beetles pollinated the first flowering plant that was, wasn't wind pollinated, which was magnolia. So, thanks to beetles, we have magnolias to make our gardens beautiful. Darwin himself was very, very keen on beetles. And this is his beetle box from Cambridge University. He collected beetles as a child, but his sister persuaded him it wasn't very nice to kill things just because he wanted to collect them. So his proper collecting of beetles really started when he was at Cambridge studying divinity. And he used to skip his lectures to go beetle hunting. There's a lovely story about um, Darwin out beetle hunting and he caught a beetle and he caught another beetle. So he put a beetle in each hand and then he spotted one he really wanted. So he shoved one of the ones in his hand in his mouth. Uh, unfortunately, it turned out to be one that we're going to come across later, which is the bombardier beetle, which squirts out an incredibly hot, acrid, acidic sort of stuff into his mouth. So he ended up having to spit that one out, didn't catch the one he was trying to catch, and was really quite cross about it. So this is one of his early collections from around Cambridge. And interestingly enough, in 2014, one of the beetles he collected on the Beagle Voyage when he was in Argentina was actually identified as a new species and named. Um, it, hadn't, it had been overlooked when he was looking at things and it had sat in a museum collection 
and not been recognised as a new species. And this is one of the rove beetles, there's an awful lot of them through, throughout the world, um, lots and lots of sorts of them, and this one had been completely overlooked. So this was first named on the 205th anniversary of Darwin's birth. How exciting is that? So there was a huge selection of kinds of beetles and an awful lot of different things I could talk about. Um, so I just thought I'd talk about some of my favourite beetles, which is a bit of an odd thing to have favourites with if you can only name six of them. But everybody loves a ladybird. These are the ones that appear in children's books. Um, they're generally regarded as a good thing. Ladybirds are a good thing. Not many people know there's 46 species of ladybirds in the UK and around 26 of them are what are called conspicuous ladybirds. These are ones that you would recognise as a ladybird. They're the shiny bright coloured ones with spots on them. Um, the others are inconspicuous ladybirds which are quite dull coloured. The commonest is the seven spots which is the one on the top left here and here he is doing what they're known best for, which is eating aphids. And this is why gardeners love them. Unfortunately, they, um, we also have harlequin ladybirds. These are a rather larger species. And beetles, insects in general, beetles in particular, are very good at creeping into the country from abroad um, in, in potted plants, in cut flowers, in wood products in all sorts of things so they can get into the country undetected and then spread out and this is what the harlequin ladybirds did and not only do they eat lots of aphids and things but they also predate um, other ladybirds that are smaller than them and ladybird larvae so these things are the ones that you find in an enormous mass going into hibernation maybe in your house your attic or your out outhouses and they're very, very variable. So they come in all sorts of patterns and you'll get great mobs of them all together, all different designs, if you like. So these are an undesirable alien. So please don't love these ones. Um, just love our native ones. Another of my favorite beetles is the Devil's Coach Horse. I mean, that's a fabulous name for a start. But it's a fabulous beetle. You don't often see them, they're nocturnal. They like to live in rather damp places, so um, leaf litter and under plants and under stones and things. And they're the largest of our rove beetles. They can reach about three centimetres long. And what a fabulous looking thing. They don't very often fly. They don't have the sort of beetle shape we used to. Um, the wings are rather reduced and the wing coverings, be beetles have four wings, but the top, top two, the, 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 the two nearest the head, are hardened and they're the, the wing casing, if you like, the elytra. And they, ha they join in the middle, they sort of, they sort of meet up like um, they don't overlap, they, they, they just join to each other. So he's got reduced wings. They, so they, they, they don't often fly, though they can. And it defends itself with this wonderful aggressive posture. And it curls up its back end, um, emits a foul smell. It emits a, an unpleasant fluid from its mouth and its rear end. And it also has large jaws and quite an unpleasant bite. Um, so you might think there's not much good to say about it, but they do a very good job of predating undesirable insects. So if you have these in your garden, it's a very good thing. <clears throat> Irish reapers, by the way, used to thought they could improve their skill by putting a devil's coach horse in the handle of their scythe. I'm not sure it worked though. Here's another predator. This is one of the ground beetles and it's a green tiger beetle. And Splendidly predatorial little creatures. We've got over 350 species of ground beetle in, in, in the UK. And this one is a smart little beast. You can see with its huge eyes, it's a it, it how that's definitely a predator, and it's very fast running. Um 
tiger beetles occur all over the world. The fastest ones are actually Australian, and they can run over five miles an hour, which when you consider the creature is only about one and a half centimeters long, that's incredible. They're really zippy things. They like brownfield sites. They like open, um, like sort of sandy, sand dunes, these sort of things, um, open terrain, and they actually pursue their prey at high speed. And sorry, here he is with his great big jaws and his big eyes, and it's an absolutely superb killing machine. Very pretty, though, very, very pretty. Here's one you don't see often. This is a glow worm, and it doesn't really look much like a beetle at all, but it is a beetle. This is a female one, and they are what they call larvae form. It's wingless. It looks pretty much like a larva. The clever thing they do, though, is they glow, which is why it's a glowworm. And this is one glowing. The females are the ones that glow, and they climb up to the top of a grass clump or something, stick their bum in the air, and make it glow. This to attract their mate. Um, the mate actually looks pretty beetle like. It's a combination of uh, a molecule called luciferin with oxygen and an enzyme called luciferase. And they can't control the oxygen input, so they don't flash like a firefly would, but they just have this steady glow in this sort of lovely greeny, yellowy colour. Don't see them so much at all now. It's, it's thought that um, the pollution, light pollution from artificial light, makes it difficult for them to find their mates. So this is a good reason to um, reduce light pollution, um, apart from it just not being very nice and not being able to see the night sky. It's very bad for these insects that rely on light to, to attract mates. They don't eat as adults but the larvae eat small snails. They're particularly prevalent in limestone areas, and you can see them in Shropshire around San Monarch, and a particularly famous site for them um, around Hodnet. This is the male one, looks pretty much a standard beetle, doesn't he? And how about this fella? This is a great diving beetle. I love catching these. Um, if I'm doing pond dipping, they're a wonderful thing. They scud around in the water, um, great big things, and highly predatorial. If you catch one, you don't put it in your aquarium with everything else because it'll just eat it all. So keep them separate. Um, absolutely wonderful. Um, great, great, great big beetle. They actually breathe by taking in air with their rear end, which they poke out of the water. They take an oxygen and they store it under their wing case so they can breathe underwater. They fly, um, they, they, they move to new sites by flying and quite often get confused by light reflection on glasshouse roofs and things and can go crashing into them. So if you find one under your greenhouse you know exactly how it got there. Um, the male ones have suction pads on their front feet uh, which means they can hold on to the female when they're mating, and the females have deep grooves on their wing cases for the same reason. So obviously it's slippery underwater. The larvae are highly predatorial. Um, they'll eat even small fish, things like tadpoles, small fish, all sorts of things. So these are the, the tigers of the, of the pond. They pupate in soft ground on the edge of the pond, so they they're in the air, if you like, rather than underwater. But then once they've hatched into an adult, they return to the water that can, can be found either around water or, or in the water. This is the bombardier beetle. This is the one that Darwin spat out. And he had very good reason to. It's a small ground beetle, so it's another of that huge group of ground beetles. And the Irritating chemicals it combines are hydrogen peroxide and hydroquinone, which are stored in separate sacks 
in its rear end and only combined when the beetle needs them to repel its predators. So basically it's got this up to 100 degrees C noxious chemical inside it, but it's expelled almost immediately. And they have a tough reaction chamber in their backside, which means it doesn't fry its own internal organs, but very, very cleverly organized. How did you evolve to do that? They're brilliant at repelling their predators. Here's one in action. Some of them are incredibly good at aiming. You know, they, they really can hit exactly where they want it to be. So this is a great way of driving off anything that's going to eat them. Can, you know, if that got in your eyes or your mouth, you really would feel it. Other ground beetles, of course, are also available. This is a violet ground beetle, which is a, a lovely thing. And these are common in your garden and they're great predators. So well worth encouraging in your garden. Here's another of my favorites. This is a cockchafer. And they're fabulous big beetles. They're, they're also known as maybugs or billy witches. And these are the ones that fly crashing into a lighted window. So you might find them under a window um, where they've flown into it and knocked themselves down. Or they'll actually fly into the house and go around your light, as moth does. Um, you can tell whether they're male or female by the number of leaves on the antennae. You see, they've got these wonderful cone-shaped antennae. And males have seven leaves on, females only have six. So you'll know to call, whether it's called a he or she. The adults of them only live around six weeks. So you see them in May and June. Um, sometimes coming out in April these days as it's getting warmer. Um, here's one on the wing, which is quite a remarkable sight. You can see how the hardened front wings are lifted up and the standard issue sort of lower wings are used for flying. The pointy bit at the end, by the way, isn't a sting or anything. They won't harm you. That's, that's an egg laying device. It's, it's pygidium, I think it's called. Um, the larvae can be a bit of a pest. They, um, they, they eat roots and tubers. They have been an agricultural pest in the past. And the species was actually taken to court in Avignon in 1320 um, and ordered to leave town and relocate to a specially designated area that they said that the cockchafers could have. Any that failed to comply would be collected and killed. Not many of them did comply. Um, the adults and grubs have also been considered a delicacy at times. So a wonderful recipe I found for them that you can you roll the larvae in flour and breadcrumbs with a little salt and pepper, wrap them in tin foil, and bake them in the embers of a fire. Um, getting them out when they've gone crispy. Uh, I'm not sure I fancy it myself, but if you want something a little exotic for your next dinner party, there you go. And if you find them a pest in your garden, at least it's something you can do with them. Other chafers are also available. These are rose chafers. Um, these are the ones that uh, children used to glue threads to and make them fly around. Um, there's also noble chafers, which are getting very rare now as they're reliant entirely on old orchards. But they're quite beautiful beetles. They have this lovely, lovely metallic sheen to them. Um, absolutely fabulous things. Stag beetles are wonderful. Now, I've actually seen an entire barbecue brought to a premature end by an invasion of stag beetles. This was down on the outskirts of London, where they're still quite common. Um, they spend five or six years as, as larvae. They're our, our biggest beetle, and they, the larvae live in rotting tree stumps and decaying wood that is in contact with the ground. They look quite fearsome and they can actually, I mean, they, they, they can nip with the, with the antlers, if you like, so it's actually part of his mandible, but they use them to fight for females. The females don't really have much of an antler at all, they, they look quite different and not really nearly as scary, but these are, can be quite alarming. Uh, they have these large grubs that, that, that are in dead wood, 
And this is one of the reasons we encourage people to have some dead wood in their garden. It needs to be touching the ground, remember. So preferably a stump left or a, a, a good big logs lying on the ground. It's quite interesting. This is the distribution of them now. Um, I've put an X in Shropshire in case you're not quite sure where you are. And we have them, basically they're appearing in adjoining counties. So do watch out for them. <coughs> and if you see one, do record it. Um, in a sense, let, let one of us at Wildlife Trust know or send it in to the People's Trust for Endangered Species. Uh, very keen to watch whether these things will increase with global warming. This is a rhinoceros bag beetle, which is a charming little creature, really. You can find these on the Clee Hills. Um, they're another species that lays its egg in, 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 in wood in the same way as a stag beetle does. But don't confuse it with the, oh, that's a female one, by the way, uh, no rhino horn on it. Um, don't confuse it with the European rhinoceros beetle, which is quite a different creature. Um, this one has actually been seen in Worcestershire, and it isn't really known whether it's breeding in the wild or it's escaped from somewhere. People keep the weirdest things for pets. Um, so watch out for those and let us know if you see one. Uh, can't really mistake it. It's, it's, it's a quite remarkable creature. Longhorn beetles, these are moving down slightly smaller beetles now. Lots of different species. There's 40, 42 British species, and these are wood recyclers again, they're, they're wood boring beetles. Um, beetles actually do quite a lot for, the, um, for us and for the environment. Without them, a lot of things that need to decay and return to the soil wouldn't do it. So these, these are, are creatures that bore into wood, um, dead wood and live wood, and lay their eggs in it. They, they, they introduce fungus to the wood and allow it to break down properly. So some of them are really quite beautiful. Uh, and they have these wonderful long antennae. These aren't the, the bark beetles. So these aren't the ones that make those intricate sort of maze patterns under the bark. And they're not the ones that were responsible for Dutch elm disease either. That was the elm bark beetle. Um, and it wasn't really the beetle, it was the fungus it carries. So don't blame the beetle too much. <clears throat> they, these ones make tunnels into the wood. Um, Native species aren't really much of a problem. This is an Asian longhorn beetle, and they are a problem. Basically, if you get a native species that doesn't have any control of it in, in this country, any predators or anything, it can cause great difficulty. And these are a serious pest of woodland. They were discovered in Kent in 2012, and after a six year program of trapping and surveillance, they were finally eradicated again by the animal and plant health people and forest commission. Serious threat to broad, broadleaf woodland. So basically, we don't want these things back in the country. There is always potential with imported timber that they will be brought back. So watch out for them. It's a big creature. It's quite easy to spot. And just for the fun of it, this is, this is the mess they make of trees. I mean, they make big, big holes in. This is one of the um, Central European varieties. It was once found in the UK, but now it's think here. It's over five centimetres long. I mean, isn't that spectacular? They did a lot of damage because they bore right into the heartwood of oaks and ruined the timber as a, as a product. But what a spectacular creature and those wonderful knobbly antennae. Absolutely lovely. They're great. Here's another of my favourites. This is a dung beetle or a door beetle. You can see really why some of these creatures never made it into children's literature, really. I mean, this is a dung beetle. Basically, it brings up its children in dung. They're not the kind that roll balls of dung. The ones in this country tend to live within piles of dung or beneath them in the soil. But that's what they do. They eat dung. Um, one of them is, a, is, is called the Minotaur beetle. And I think this fellow's really spectacular. 
and it specializes in rabbit droppings, which it rolls down into its nest chambers. So that the, uh, the young larvae have something to feed on. Um, without these things, we'd really be in trouble. This is ball rolling kind. Is a quite quite a, an, an interesting a, an interesting thing in in Australia because when they imported all those cattle and sheep and everything, there weren't any dung beetles there that could cope with that kind of poop. They'd been used to living on marsupial poop, the ones they have, which is pretty dry and little pellets and things. Yeah, not too much of a problem, but. The amount of undecomposed dung in Australia after they brought in all these domestic animals um, led to huge swarms of bush flies, which um, they had to do something about it basically. So between 1968, 1969 and 1982, they imported dung beetles to Australia just to clear up all that mess. And they did a very good job of it. So these are the ones that roll the balls of it and you find them in Africa and Australia now and warm places but ours don't do that which is a shame really because it's quite fun. Here's another of our cleaners upper. This is a sexman beetle and these are great little animals. They can smell out a small dead body for up to a mile away and once they've found one, they've paired up and the pair will fight cooperatively any other pairs so they have their own corpse to lay their eggs on. And they take all the hair and feathers and everything off it, shape it into a ball, keep, clean it up really well, and then dig a hole under it and bury it. It can be up, up 60 centimetres underground. Then they lay their eggs on it, immediately above the body, and they look after their youngsters. And if one of the pair dies, the other one will continue looking after the larvae. So these are really family conscious beetles. This lot here, um, you've got three pairs, which will be having a scrap over this splendid dead vault, and um, it is going to provide enough food for their entire brood. So. Absolutely wonderful to find out that insects have a sort of family minded. Sexton beetles really are. And they do an absolutely splendid job. Um, they're also known as burying beetles. There are various sorts of carrion beetles and they're very important for cleaning up the countryside. Otherwise, there'd be, I mean, if you think of them and the dung beetles, we'd be up to our necks in poop and dead things, basically. Um, so, it's a jolly good job we've got beetles. This one doesn't really do very much, but I was very pleased to find it. This is a thick legged flower beetle. Lots and lots of sorts of flower beetles, and they're pollinators. So, this is another service beetles are doing for us. They're pollinating. So, it's not just the bees, it's not just the butterflies, beetles do it too. Only the males have these strange swollen thighs. And it's quite a widely distributed species right across Western low, Lowland Europe and the Mediterranean. But it's, 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 it's one of the ones that's expanding into Britain. Um, once it was, it was only common in the south of Britain and now it's spreading. I'm particularly pleased with this photograph because when I took it, um, they haven't really been recorded in North Wales before. And this was taken on Flint Peninsula. So it had got quite a long way from the Mediterranean. Uh, there's a, a closer up one, and you can see it's got these bulgy thighs. They're a lovely metallic green colour, and they like these open flowers. Uh, you know, just sort of open structured flowers. So if you want to encourage beetles into your garden, this is the kind of flower to grow. These and um, umbellifers that have a flat platform. Now, isn't that cute? This is an acorn weevil, and weevils all have this long snout um, or rostrum, uh, but it's not used like a butterfly does, to sort of as a straw. They actually have teeth in the end of it. So this little creature 
which it, it, there's, there's more than 60,000 species of, of weevil described worldwide. Most of them are fairly specific to one plant family. <clears throat> this is an acorn weevil, you see bean and pea weevils, and vine weevils that are a pest in gardens. Um, it, so the female one bores into its acorn with its this long rostrum snout, and then lays its egg in it. The larva hatches, feeds on the acorn, and it tunnels out as an adult. And it's only about maybe five millimetres long, not tiny thing. It's not one of the ones that forms galls on eggs, those are those are gall wasps. So this one just eats acorns. But he looks quite lovable, doesn't he? He's got those big eyes and sort of slightly furry looking. I love them, I think they're great. But uh, some of these things can become pests, but they do quite a lot of good in um, preventing too many seeds being so wasted. Um, you know, they 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 basically form a control on on species that would otherwise become um, prevalent. This one has to go in just because it has some really entertaining habits. This is a tortoise beetle, and as you see, it's almost saucer shaped. And like a tortoise, when it's disturbed, it clamps itself down, it pulls its legs in and its antlers and sorry antennae in and becomes just a flat mound. The best thing about it is its behaviour as, as a larva. This is a larva one on the bottom right. They have two spikes on their rear end, which will stand up like that, and they collect poop, their own poop. This is insect poop, it's called frass. Um, they collect poop and bits of skin and things on it, and also wet, almost wear it over their head like an umbrella. And this is thought to camouflage them and put things off eating them. Um, basically, if your McDonald's came in that sort of casing, you wouldn't fancy eating much, would you? So this is an absolutely great thing. It's just hugely entertaining. Um, these are actually thistle. Um, they, 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 they live mainly on thistles. Look out for them, dead nettles, um, that sort of thing. Um, I guarantee it's one of the most entertaining things you can find. And this is a pot beetle. This one also has a place close to my heart, but just because of its behaviour, if you like. Um, there's a lot of, lot of different species on 19 species in the UK, and most of them are declining or rare. And they really quite entertaining it, it looks a bit like a, a labor gone wrong doesn't it but the most entertaining thing about it is that when the female lays her eggs she spends quite a lot of time covering them in a waxy coating and then some of her own dropping uh, that's the frass again so she makes it into a, a sort of eggshell if you like with the egg in the middle um can take her about 10 minutes per egg so it's quite an investment but it's time well spent it deters predators once she's coated the egg properly she drops it to the ground and it goes into the leaf litter from the flower or leaf she's sitting on and then once the larvae hatch they stay in the protective egg case and eating fallen leaves at the bottom of the food plant and enlarge the neck of their pot with their own droppings. So they build it up as they grow. And it's what makes almost a little snail shell for them. They, they, they stay within their case. Um, they do get predated, even despite their um, little outfit. But given that they can take, you know, they can, some of them can take two years to develop into an adult. Um, when they when they get to that stage, they seal up their larval case, pupate within it, <clears throat> and emerge a few weeks later. But these you know, pot beetles aren't they fabulous? I mean, what a way to bring up your kids! Just think about it.
So you want to look after these things in your garden because they do lots and lots of good. Far more of them are doing good than are causing problems. So a nice wood pile is a really good, good way to encourage beetles. You can make a, a more sort of insect hotel type thing. Um, lots of different materials in it will offer opportunities for different creatures. You can download our, um, the, the, the bring back our beetles, um, like that, from uh, it was the Wild Bad Gardens thing, and it's got all these different ideas in it. Um, <clears throat> record your beetles, learn, learn who they are, send in records, let us know about the distribution of it. Stumperies are really good. These are great for things like the um, stag beetles and um, the, the wood borers. And, you know, it can, it can look very nice. Grow some ferns around it. It'll look very attractive. Compost heaps are good for them. The, the, the ground beetles and road beetles love those sort of areas. You can make a, a beetle bucket. You can make a dead hedge. This is, this is, this is dead hedge. There's lots of opportunity for breeding beetles. It's just basically dead stick laid up hedge hedge style and they'll use it for um growing their young in the beetle bucket instructions are available or you can watch me making an absolute fool of myself on youtube um making a beetle bucket um that's part of the 30 days wild thing um they're absolutely great it, you can lift them out and see what's in them what wonderful thing to get the kids involved and these dead wood and bark and things Make a really good habitat. So look after your beetles. Make them a beetle bucket. Make them a dead hedge. Make them, um, make them a stumpery. Um, it, it, it must be a dark, damp corner of your garden that you don't really like very much. A wood pile would be good. If you've only got a small space, a beetle bucket would be great. Biggest thing you can do to make a difference, though, join us today. The more reserves we have, the more different habitats we can look after, for some of these less common beetles to, to live in. So you can join the Wildlife Trust. Three months of family membership cost less than 25 ladybirds from an organic garden supplies company. So look after all those wild ones. Look after them in your garden and help us look after the habitats that are going to keep them thriving in our countryside. So many of them have been dreadfully reduced by the amount of pesticides and insecticides used on farmland. They need somewhere to go. Help us look after them and watch out for them. Cherish your beetles. Go out and see how many you can find just in your garden. Great fun. Get the kids involved. Go well today and really get into beetles. Thank you very much. <laughs>